Well, over the past 50 years, I've observed so much needless pain in the lives of so many Christians that's come primarily from just a misunderstanding of God's character. And so God has been blamed so many times for a lot of things that are just not his doing. So this t teaching today can be of real benefit, I think, to all of us. Now, I call this the misconceptions about God's character. Now, this is one of my very favorite teachings because I firmly believe that we absolutely cannot go on with God until we get this truth firmly settled in our mind. The first two scriptures I'm going to give you, John 1 verse 1 and verse 14. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Okay, now grace and truth, those are the words now I'm wanting you to hang on to because uh, this is what Jesus has brought to us. Now, the word that was with God, that was God, you know, uh, some 2,000 years ago, came down to live with us on earth so that we could have this grace and this truth. And John 1.17 says, For the law was given through mercy, Moses, but grace and truth was given through Jesus Christ. The law was never established to show us the full truth. That was never what it was for. Now, John 1, 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he is the one who has come to explain. Jesus is the one who came to explain him, explain the Father. And Jesus came to explain the Father, and the Old Testament could not explain the Father. There was no way. It took Jesus coming to earth to explain Him. Now, the only way we're ever going to have an accurate explanation of the Father is through Jesus Christ. If we could just get these few scriptures now clearly in our thinking, boy, it would settle every misconception that we've ever had. Number one, the Word was with God from the beginning. And number two, the Word took on a body and came to live with us in order, number three, to teach us the truth about God. You know, and uh, d just to, to show us uh, exactly what we have to have to be able to live the good life. And um, this same truth is reiterated all through the New Testament. Now, in Hebrews 1, verse 3, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And he is the exact representation of God's nature. You know, when you think about that, that Jesus is the exact representation of God. If we want to know what God's like, we look at Jesus. He's the exact representation. And he, Jesus, as upholds all things by the word of his power. And after he made purification of our sins by taking those sins on his own body on the cross and taking the penalty, taking the punishment for all of our sins, then he sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So Jesus took our penalty. He took our punishment for us. Now, when anyone ever wanted to know about God, the Bible never once pointed them to the Old Testament, not even once. Never did it say, go look at the Old Testament. It's going to give you an accurate picture of, of the Father. No, it always pointed to Jesus. Jesus is the only one who explained the Father God. Old Testament prophets, they, they didn't have a vivid picture of God. They knew a little bit about him, but they, they didn't have a full picture. 1 Corinthians 13 says that prophecy is seen through a glass darkly. Have you ever uh, looked through a cloudy glass? You might be able to make a few images out in the, in the house, but you're never going to get a crystal clear picture. Old Testament prophecy now was never intended to give us an exact picture of God. It was Jesus Christ who was sent to give us that clear picture. Yet in spite of that fact that the Bible very clearly tells us that only Jesus is the exact picture of God, we still find that man will often point to portions of the Old Testament and draw conclusions about what he thinks God is like. And we see this happening sadly. Now, that amazes me that it's said so clearly, and people still will run to the Old Testament. And that's why some people get into so much trouble in their theology. You know, you've seen people who love God dearly, but nothing ever seems to go well for them. Well, so often you'll find that it's because they are confused about what God is like. They have a confusion in their heart, and they credit God with bad things that are not coming from God. Now, from the time of Abraham down through the ages, there has been a progressive revelation of the character of God. 
God revealed just a little more and a little more of his character as time went on until the great and final revelation of himself now through Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus said. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He didn't say, uh, if you study the Old Testament, you're going to know what, what God is like. He never says that. So as long as you look to the Old Testament to try to understand God's character, you're going to have a very limited revelation of God. If you take Old Testament scriptures at face value here and there, you're going to get a, a misconception about God. So the true character of God now has to be settled before we're ever going to be able to go on and know the, the full truth. Now, a lot of people think they have settled this in their mind, and they say, well, I understand God. I understand that he's not the one that's dealing us the evil. I've got it settled that healing is a part of the atonement, and they appear to be on a really firm foundation uh, theologically. But I've seen this happen over and over when God will turn some evil around and bring good out of it, and uh, just like he did in Genesis 50, 20 with Joseph, then some people become double-minded and all of a sudden they begin to think, well, maybe God did send the sickness because, uh, or this calamity because after all, look at all the good that came out of it. And I hear that from so many people, or at least they think God allowed it because of the good that came out of it. And they begin to waver in that, oh, the end justifies the means theory. Yes, God will take what was meant for evil and many times he'll bring good out of it and uh, and he'll make it turn out to be so good that we just say, oh God, I can't believe how wonderful this turned out. And he'll do that if we trust him and if we love him. But it doesn't mean that he's the one that sent the evil. He's not the one that planned it. It's Satan's trick to get us double-minded. And it's Satan's trick to get us hesitant about what we know about God based on the character of Jesus. Now, our becoming double-minded in this area is a part of Satan's plan. Because I'm going to tell you what. He's waiting for an opportunity to send something bad that we'll accept because we think it's coming from God. Now, Satan knows that if he can get us to that place, he can bring destruction. He knows that. Now, I can't even begin to tell you how important it is for us to have our mind totally renewed to what the Word of God teaches about the character of God. That's why I love this, this Bible study. When we understand the truth, it will set us free. If we misunderstand, if we misinterpret the truth, it's going to put us in bondage every single time. And that's why the Word says that you'll know uh, the truth, and it's that truth that's going to set us free. Now, if any scripture tends to contradict the character of God shown in Jesus by making it appear that God's the one sending the evil for whatever reason, then we are misinterpreting that scripture. You can know immediately you are, and that can be so dangerous. Now, you've all seen in the Old Testament where it said that God sent a plague or God destroyed or a pestilence came from God. And early on, that would really confuse me. And I always thought, boy, it looks as though there's a different God in the Old Testament than the one in the New Testament, you know. And I never could understand. And I kept crying out to God and saying, God, I need understanding on this. I said, Lord, your word says that you change not. So uh, I, I just want to show you today what God began revealing to me to answer my questions. Now, my objective today is for us to know the truth about God. And when we do, it will set us totally free. Because until this particular issue is settled, number one, our trust now will be limited. It's hard to trust someone when you're not sure what he might do to you. That's really hard. And number two, it'll hinder your boldness in taking authority over the enemy because something will come along and you won't be sure whether it's coming from God or whether it's coming from the enemy. So you won't use your authority against it because of fear. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 8. The, the writer of Hebrews is showing us the difference between the two covenants. And he gives us so many answers uh, in this small portion of Scripture. Uh, he shows us that there's such a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Hebrews 8, verse 6, For now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Talking about our New Testament covenant. Now notice that it says that our, our new covenant has been established on better promises than what they had under the old covenant. In Hebrews 8, verse 7, if the Old Testament had been faultless, there would have been no reason for a second covenant. You need to mark that in your Bible. Because if the Old Testament had been faultless, the Bible says there would have been no reason for that second covenant. Okay, this tells us now the, that the Old Testament was not faultless. It had fault. 
And Hebrews 8, verses 8 and 9, for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah, not like the old, old covenant which I made with their fathers. And then in verse 10, God describes what the new covenant is going to be. He said, for this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, says the Lord. He said, in, in the new covenant, I'm going to put my laws in their minds, and I'm going to write these laws on their heart, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And then verse 11, for under the new covenant, they will not have to teach everyone saying, know the Lord, because under this new covenant, he says, they will all know me from the least to the greatest. You need to take this Hebrews chapter and start marking all of these scriptures because they're so powerful. And then in verse 12, for then I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Now, the reason that God can say, I will remember the sins no more is because of the blood that Jesus was going to shed on the cross. It will have washed away our sins when we receive him and when we receive these promises. Now, the commentator says, under the new covenant, they will gaze at Jesus with wide open eyes as though gazing at something wonderful. That, that's what the commentary, will gaze at him with wide open eyes as though gazing at something wonderful. When we fully understand what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, they didn't know Jesus under the old covenant. Now, God was saying that under the, the new covenant through Jesus, we can know God intimately and we can now discern him clearly and we can experience his true character. They couldn't do that under the old covenant. Now he's clearly saying here that the people of the Old Testament on a whole only knew about God. But under the new covenant, he said, you're going to truly all know me, God said. And you can know what I'm really like through Jesus because it's all in Jesus. That's why Jesus came, so that we could know the Father and so that he could remove the thing that was going to keep us from being able to live with him eternally. Now, he compared the Old Testament to the New Testament, and he's saying here, don't look at the Old Covenant to know me. They only had knowledge about me, he said. But he said, under this New Covenant now, you can know who I really am from the least to the greatest. Now, could not, God could not have said it any more clearly. I mean, we need to mark these places in our Bible and read them often. Evil never comes from God. You need to just get that down in your heart that evil never comes from God. You never saw evil in Jesus because evil never comes from God. There's no evil in Jesus. There's no evil in God. Now, in Ezekiel 28, 14 through 18, the Bible tells us where evil came from. Now, we're just going to hit the high spots here. You can study this later on your own, on your own. But it's referring to Lucifer. Lucifer is personified here as the king of Tyre. And Ezekiel 28, 14, Lucifer, you were the anointed cherub who covered. And God said, I placed you there. Now, before Lucifer rebelled against God, he was the high anointed angel. And God said, you walked on my holy mountain and you were blameless. You were without sin from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. So God created Lucifer righteous without sin. Verse 16, by, but by the abundance of your trade, by the abundance of your occupation, you became internally filled with violence and you sinned. So there in verse 16, God then cast him off of the holy mountain and destroyed his exalted position. Now, it's very important to realize that Lucifer was blameless. He was without sin when he was created until he chose to sin. And in verse 17, God said, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before the kings so they could see you, so they could see what you, Lucifer, had become because of your sin. And then in verse 18, by the multitude of Lucifer's sin and because of the unrighteousness of his trade or of his career, his job, he profaned his sanctuaries. In other words, he caused a third of the angels to fall with him who served under him. Now, in the abundance of your trade, in your business dealings, you peddled your sinful merchandise and you brought one third of the angels down. Okay, when Lucifer sinned, he corrupted his wisdom. He became perverted and he was internally then filled with sin and violence. And sadly, 
it didn't stay there. It says that he peddled his merchandise. He peddled his sin. He spread it to others. And in so doing then, he profaned the sanctuaries. In other words, he, he, he spread it on to a third of the angels who served with him. Now, God didn't create sin. He didn't create Lucifer with a sinful nature. When, when Lucifer opened himself up to pride, we find that sin came into his being. And that's when he started peddling that merchandise. And he, he didn't keep it to himself. It would have helped if he had just kept it to himself. And that sin then spread. And in the last part of verse 18, the very evil itself turned and consumed many others. Now, when, uh, when we stay in sin, it's not going to stay with us. Anytime a person stays in sin, they're going to corrupt others. It, it doesn't stay within that person. That's exactly what happened with Lucifer. He spread it to others. It's really not even Satan who ultimately consumes and brings death. The sin itself now, when a person yields to temptation and when a person falls into the sin, the sin itself consumes and destroys and brings death to others. And that's why God in his love is continually warning us in his word. And he's trying so hard to keep us from partaking of the evil. And uh, because we have a free will, we can partake of it if we want to. Because God knows that evil now will eventually turn and literally consume the person. Because there's a law of sowing and reaping. Anything we sow, what we do, we're going to reap when we put it out. And verse 18 says that the fire in the, on the inside of Lucifer has consumed you. The sin or the evil on the inside of Lucifer, the pride, the lust, the greed, all this selfishness that finally came in will turn and consume if it's not repented of. It's a spiritual law that works as surely as the law of gravity works. Now, I said earlier that under the old covenant, God was progressively revealing a little more about himself and a little more. He showed himself as the Jehovah Jireh, that he was the one that provided. And then he showed himself as, as the Rapha, the healer. And on and on, he showed more and more of himself. Okay, by the same token, the people under the old covenant, they also had a very limited revelation about Satan. In fact, for the most part, they only knew one force and one power. They only knew about God. And since they were only aware of God's power for the most part, God was given credit for everything that happened supernaturally. Everything was he was given credit for. He was given credit for the evil as well as the good. If it was supernaturally good, God got credit. If it was supernaturally bad, God got credit. And uh, they, they didn't know about Satan. You know, uh, my daughter Angela had a Bible professor at Howard Payne University, and he put it this way. He said that the Hebrew mind only knew one power. They only knew about God. So he said whatever happened in the supernatural realm in the Old Testament was credited to God because they only knew that one power. Okay, now on a very few occasions, the Holy Spirit revealed the source of the demonic realm in the Old Testament, in just a few places. But on a whole, God was given credit for everything uh, that, that was evil. For example, in the Old Testament, you'll find a few places where it says that an evil spirit was sent from God. Okay, you have to interpret that now in light of the overall word. Remember, they only knew one power. But Jesus cleared it up in the New Testament when he very plainly taught about Satan. He taught about the thief. He said, the thief is the one who comes to destroy. Now, remember, we have to always look to Jesus to see what God is like. That's the only way we're going to get a true picture of God. That's where we see the total truth. Now, they had accused Jesus now of casting out spirits by the power of Beelzebub. And he said, no. If Beelzebub casts out his own evil spirits, it'll be a house divided and it won't stand. So he made it very clear that that was not where he was getting any of his power. Uh, now, in the book of Jonah, they talked about the destructive storm coming from God. And yet under the new covenant, uh, we know that Jesus rebuked the storm. So we know that he didn't send it in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. God didn't change characters between the Old and the New uh, Testament. They just had uh, recognition of one power back then. But God couldn't be the one sending the storm and the one rebuking the storm. It would have been a house divided. Now, in Psalm 94, verse 20, he said, Can a throne of destruction that devises evil, can it have fellowship with you, God? And then he said, No, it can't. Uh, 
Now, that particular Old Testament writer realized that a throne of destruction could never be in alliance with the good God. And uh, he was letting us know that God cannot be unequally yoked. Now, some people think, okay, the evil's not coming from God, but God just uses Satan. No, God does not use Satan, or he do and he also doesn't use any of his dirty work. He doesn't do that. Do you remember when Jesus would do a miracle and they would say, don't tell anyone because it's not yet the proper time for me to be uh, revealed? Okay, by the same token in the Old Testament, it was not yet the proper time uh, to reveal the enemy until the new covenant because Jesus had not yet overcome the enemy by going to the cross. Jesus had not yet bought back the authority that Adam had lost until the cross. Now, Satan was mentioned very few times in the Old Testament. When you look through the Old Testament, you'll just find uh, the name Satan just maybe uh, four or five times. They knew very little about the enemy because they were powerless against him anyway. Their total protection was just staying up close to God and being obedient. Well, we do the same thing with our children. The Lord showed me uh, this illustration. He said, if a killer was loose in the city, we wouldn't frighten our little child by telling him about that killer because that child was powerless against him anyway. So we wouldn't say that, uh, just like the people in the Old Testament were, were powerless against uh, the enemy in the Old Testament. We would simply give that child some rules to go by. We would say, come straight home from school. Don't talk to strangers. Don't get in the car with a stranger. And their obedience would become their protection. Well, that's basically exactly what God did in the Old Testament. We read earlier where God called the people under the Old Covenant children. Well, they were powerless against this unseen enemy. But God then gave them some rules. And as they were obedient, it became protection for them from the enemy. Now, the enemy that they actually knew very little, if anything, about, uh, then uh, they couldn't, they had no power against him. But as they, they were protected, as they obeyed God, that law protected them. And that was their only protection in the Old Testament. Jesus had not gone to the cross at that point. So now today, because people tend to look to the Old Testament, which is a very limited revelation of God, instead of looking to Jesus, who is the exact representation of God, uh, there's confusion as to what comes from God and what's not from God until we decide to listen to what Jesus is telling us in the Word of God. Okay, now let me give you some examples that uh, demonstrate their limited understanding. Uh, I'm going to give you two scriptures out of the Old Testament that are about the same, it's telling about the same uh, happening. In 2 Samuel 24.1, this is confusing because David had been told by God not to number the people. But here in 2 Samuel 24, it says that God incited him or tempted him to number the people. Well, that's very contradictory. That's confusing. And when you look at it, you think, oh, what's going on here? But when you look closely enough, even in the Old Testament, you're going to find the truth. Because when you go on over and look at 1 Chronicles 21.1, there's a cross-reference. This is another account now of the exact same story. But this account said that Satan stood against Israel and moved David to number the people. But 2 Samuel now had said that it was God who had moved David to number the people. See, Old Testament people had a very limited understanding of Satan. But somehow the writer of 1 Chronicles had uh, godly insight, and he knew that it wasn't God, but it was Satan who had done this. So when you look through, through even the Old Testament, you're going to find the truth is there. Now, this is one of the few times in the Old Testament when Satan was actually called by his name Satan. Uh, the writer of 2 Samuel knew only that it was a supernatural power that incited David. So he gave uh, uh, God the credit. But somehow the writer of 1 Chronicles had supernatural insight and he realized uh, that it was a, a revelation from the Holy Spirit and it was indeed Satan, not God, who had tempted David to do the numbering. And you say, but are, are you trying to say that the Bible isn't true when the Old Testament says that God uh, sent the evil? No, I'm not saying that the Bible isn't true. What I am saying is there was not a complete revelation of the character of God in the Old Testament. That didn't make the Old Testament in error. They just didn't have the full truth if they stopped any point along the way. 
They had just been given that much revelation, and that revelation wasn't complete at that point. And that's why they were told that we can only get the full truth through Christ Jesus. That's one reason he came, to reveal the truth. Another example is in Job 1 verse 16. It says that the fire of God from heaven smote Job's possessions. But if you keep reading, you find in in Job 2 verse 7 that it says that Satan smote Job. Now, when God is blamed for sending evil, if you'll just search, you're going to find the overall truth of God is going to come out. You're going to find it even in the Old Testament, and you'll find that God is never the one that's sending the evil. They just had a misunderstanding in the Old Testament. It was completely cleared up when Jesus came. Now, in the Old Testament, when you find a scripture that looks like God's doing the destroying, just keep reading, and you'll find the truth. For example, in Exodus 12, verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, God said, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. But if we just keep reading in that same chapter, Exodus 12, verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the doorpost, the Lord will pass over the door and he will not allow the destroyer to come into your house and destroy you. So when you keep reading, you're going to get the truth, but you have to dig for it at times in the Old Testament. If you keep reading, you'll realize that it's the destroyer, not God, who did the destroying. Is God the destroyer? No. You know, are good angels, do they bring destruction? Never. In 1 Corinthians 10.10 in the New Testament, it says, don't grumble and be destroyed by the destroyer. So when we get... Uh, to the New Testament, it starts giving us the answers. We start seeing the truth. Okay, who is the destroyer? Well, God and Satan can't both be the destroyer. Jesus said the thief comes to destroy. So he's telling us very plainly in the New Testament who the destroyer is. Did Satan and God change places between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Did God destroy in the Old Testament and Satan destroy under the New Testament? No. Isaiah 21 verse 2 and Isaiah... 33 verse 1 gives us a lot of revelation. Isaiah 21, 2, a harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously, and the destroyer still destroys. Okay, now God is often given credit right here. But God is not the treacherous one. He is not the destroyer. And in Isaiah 33, verse 1, it says, Woe to you, O destroyer, while you were not destroyed. As soon as you finish destroying, you shall be destroyed. As soon as you shall cease to do treacherously, others will deal treacherously with you. These scriptures are very plainly telling us who is the treacherous one and who is the destroyer. Okay, now Satan is the destroyer. He's the one who deals treacherously. God and Satan cannot both be the destroyer. They have not traded places. So if you look closely, even the Old Testament will spell out the truth. Yet it was not always clear in their thinking because of their limited knowledge. They gave God credit for destruction many, many times. Now in 2 Samuel 14, 14, God does not take away life, but he plans ways so that the banished one is not cast out. So this tells us very clearly that he's not the one that takes away life. He, his, he plans ways so that the one that has been cast out even has a way to come back in. Uh, you know, it, it, part of the limited understanding of God's character in the Old Testament is because of the Hebrew verb translation. Many of you have a New American Standard Bible. The producers of the New American Standard makes this statement in the front of their Bible. They said the logical sequence of tenses in the Hebrew still remains a puzzling factor in the translation. So he's saying we're not always right when we've made translations in the Old Testament because it's confusing. It says that it remains puzzling, so at times it is going to be confusing to them. But when we know to look to Jesus to get our answers, we can get the right answer every single time. Now, a good example is in Deuteronomy 28 where the curses are listed. And it's written that the curses came because of sin, but it's translated in the causative, leaving the impression that God is the one who caused and sent the curses. The curses came as a result of the law of sowing and reaping. What a person sowed, that's what was going to come back on them. It wasn't God sending the evil. 
In Psalm 7, 12 through 16, if a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. So it sounds like God's the one doing this. It says he has bent his bow and he's made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Okay, so, you know, as they're reading that, it, you think, oh, okay, God's getting ready to take care of the evil. Uh, and then it starts saying he travails with wickedness. And that lets us know immediately God does not travail with wickedness. This is not talking about God. It's not talking about uh, anyone except the evil one. God does not travail with wickedness. He does not travail with uh, anything that we would be uh, a, a, a disagreement with the character of God. It's talking strictly about the enemy. Now, destruction comes from sin. May not necessarily be a sin that you've committed, but it comes from the harvest of sin that's in the world. There's a huge harvest of sin. Okay, how does Jesus describe his father? A son should be able to describe his father better than anyone else. So we need to look at how Jesus describes the father. In Matthew 5, verse 45, Jesus said, The father comes, uh, causes the son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. He doesn't just come along and say, okay, I'm going to pour good down on this person because they're good, but I, I'm not going to do anything good for the evil one. No, uh, he, he, he sends his righteousness on the good as well as the evil. The unbelievable thing about God is that he's kind to men who definitely do not deserve it. He shows mercy even to ungrateful men. But instead of seeing God in the image now of Jesus Christ, what's happened to so many people, they have tried to make God fit into the image that they have of him rather than believing what God's word tells them. See, we many times have a distorted view from what we've been taught in the past. And we have to stop and say, it doesn't matter what I've been taught in the past. I've got to look at the life of Jesus. And that's where our mind has to be renewed to the truths in God's word. In the new covenant, in 1 John 1, 5, it says that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. We need to take these scriptures that give us such a definite description of God. And we need to circle them and go back and reread them and reread them to know what God's like. God has no evil in him. The Bible says he is light. There's no darkness in him, the Bible says. Calamity and lack and sickness and destruction. These, these things always equal darkness. And when man talks about God now uh, destroying or God sending calamity, we can know that God is not the one sending it because there's no evil in him to send. There's no darkness in that light. Then some would say, well, what about God's discipline? Maybe these bad things happen to me. Uh, they're just God disciplining me, like a father spanking a child. Well, God's a spirit, and the scripture proves in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, that God's discipline, some of your translations will say training, training and discipline are the same Greek word. So God's discipline or God's training us, it says by his word not by sending calamities on his children. If we're his children, God disciplines us, but he's a spirit and he disciplines us in our spirit with the word of God. Now there always has been and there always will be a penalty for sin. And that's why Jesus told the lame man, sin no more so a worse thing doesn't come on you. Jesus knew that when a person stays in sin, consequences were going to come. But God is never Anywhere in the word of God, he's never the one sending the evil consequences. The very evil from the sin itself is what turns and consumes. And it brings bitterness, it brings venereal disease, hate, unforgiveness. All these co things come from the sin itself. Now, many people say that the great tribulation is God pouring out his wrath on mankind. I can remember the first time I heard this scripture they were talking about the great tribulation. They were talking about how God was going to send all these, this evil on the evil people. But that's not, that's not true. In reality, the tribulation is man's own penalty on himself that comes back on him. If they don't repent, it's the law of sowing and reaping. What they've sown, they're going to reap. It's going to come back, but it's not coming from God. It's coming from their own sin. God sent Jesus so that no man would have to die. He said, I came not to destroy, but I came to save. But when man refuses God's way out, the penalty is going to come, but it's not coming from God.
The penalty is man's own sin turning back on him, the law of sowing and reaping. Now, I'm certainly not minimizing the consequences of sin. I'm simply wanting us to discern very clearly where the evil's coming from because it's not coming from God. The wages of sin is death, but the penalty is not coming from God. God, in his mercy, he holds a person back from destruction anytime it's possible, but he's not going to violate our will. So there comes a time that a person is turned loose to make his own choices, to make his own decisions. There does come a time when God holds up his hand and he says it's enough. And at that point, a person is turned over to their own consequences, to their own decisions, to their own uh, whatever they've chosen. But God gives us every chance possible to repent. Romans says it so clearly. Romans 1.21 says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, and they did not give Him thanks, but they became futile in their own speculations, and their foolish hearts became darkened. That was their own consequences that came. It wasn't coming from God. In verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. And then Romans 1, 24 says, because of that, because of their, the exchange they made, therefore God didn't send bad things on them. God just simply gave them over to the lush of their own flesh and to their own impurity. Then in verse 25, it says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And then verse 26 says, for that reason, not because God sent something bad on them, but because they exchanged the truth for a lie, then uh, God gave them over to their own sin. Verse 28, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God then just gave them over to what they wanted, gave them over to their own decision, their own depraved mind to do those things that were not proper. So it, it's, a, it's like it's a tug of war. God was pulling and trying to get man to come to him, and man was fighting to go his own sinful way. It was like a, a tug of war the whole time. God gave us a free will, and he holds us back now from the destruction of the choices we've made until we determine to stay in those choices. God is not the one, never has been the one, who destroys us. He simply finally has no choice but to give us over to the choices that we have determined in our heart that we're going to hang on to. For example, now in the Old Testament, it says God gave Israel into the hands of the enemy. Well, if you read ahead of that, God had pleaded with them to repent. He had held them back from their destruction. But when they refused to repent, they were finally turned over to go their own way. But it was their own sin. It was not anything that God put on them. It was God just turned them loose to the choices they had made. And uh, that put them, they put themselves in the enemy territory. It's the law of sowing and reaping that governs the good, governs the good as well as the evil. God created the law of sowing and reaping to bring good. That's the only reason it was created. But when man operates the law of sowing and reaping now in reverse, the only thing that it can bring is evil. Because what a person now sows is what he's going to reap if he doesn't come to repentance. Now, there simply comes a time when man has persisted in his sin until he's totally out from under God's protection. And when that happens, at that point, then the evil is reversed and it consumes the person but it's not coming from God. It, it's coming from his own decisions, his own uh, evil. Now remember in our Ezekiel scripture, it was the fire from Lucifer himself that turned and consumed him. You know, God didn't do it. It wasn't a fire from God. It was, it was a fire that came out of himself that turned and consumed. The only evil that exists is that which evolves from sin. There's no, you know, it doesn't ever evolve from God. You'll never find in the Word of God where the evil evolved from God. God has no sin. He has no evil in himself to put on us. He just doesn't have it. It comes from our own sins. If we persist, then those own sins turn and consume us. In James 1.17, this is a powerful scripture. Uh, if we took this one scripture and just read it every day, it would change our life. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above. 
He doesn't say most of the time it's the good and perfect gifts that come. No, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, doesn't come down from darkness, with whom it says there's no variation. In other words, it's letting us know there's no variation. God doesn't give good one time and evil another. He said every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there's no variation. God is good always. He has no evil in himself to sin. And um, so in Luke 9, verse 54, when James and John saw people doing wrong, they asked, Lord, do you want us to uh, send fire to come down and destroy them? Because they're, they're doing wrong. They're in evil. And in Luke 9, 55 and 56, Jesus turned and he rebuked them. And he said, you, don't, you have no idea what kind of spirit you're of when you suggest something like that. He said that... I don't, I don't operate that way. The Son of God did not come to destroy men's lives, but it tells us very clearly he only came to save them. Now, Jesus was constantly trying to clear up the theology. He was constantly trying to give them a fuller, fuller revelation of God who is truly good, totally good. Now, even in Matthew 5, verse 38, Jesus said, you've heard it said in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye. But he said... That's not what I'm saying. He said, I'm telling you, love your enemy and do good. Okay, what's he saying here? Did the word change? Did God change? No. He said, I, the Lord God, change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was simply saying, under the old covenant, they had a limited view of God's character. They only knew an eye for an eye. That's all they knew. But he said, now I'm revealing my true character. I'm revealing the character of God to you. And so he said, I want you to notice what God says about himself. God sends rain and sunshine on both the righteous and the unrighteous. He doesn't send rain and sunshine just on the righteous. He doesn't do that. A person will see God in one of two ways. He's going to see God in the light of what's in himself, or he's going to see God by what he's been taught. Our own character influences the way that we see the character of God. 2 Samuel 22, verse 26, and also Psalm 18, verse 25, says that the kind are going to see God as kind. The pure will see God as a pure God. The blameless are going to see God as blameless. But it says the perverted will see him as twisted. Well, God's not twisted, but any time a person is perverted, they're going to see God that, that way because that's what's inside of themselves. We see God whatever's inside of ourselves. We have to get those things that are wrong out of our computer. We have to cleanse ourselves and start looking at Jesus to know exactly what God is like. And we have to put truth back in so that we can see God in light of the true word, in light of his son Jesus. Now, if we're not pure in our heart, we're not going to see God as pure. And that's why it's so important to get into a love walk and begin to understand the godly love that comes from God. That's the only way we're going, going to really know Jesus, know God as he really is. And as we do, the more we're going to be seeing God as a God of love, the God of love that he is. And when we let purity dwell in us, then we're going to see God's purity. You know, now at times you're going to hear people and they'll actually be boasting about some hardship that they're going through that God sent on them to perfect them. I've even heard people say that. And you can so easily uh, see that that turns into pride of what they're able to endure for God, you know. But none of that is lined up with the Word of God because God tells us very clearly what to boast about, you know. God doesn't send the hardships. And so in, he says, look to Jeremiah 9, 24. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast about his wisdom. Don't let the mighty man boast of his might. Don't let the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast that he understands and knows me, saith God. Boast that he knows that I am the God who exercises loving kindness. I'm the God who exercises justice and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in those things, declares the Lord. He could not have, it could not have been said any more clearly than it was said right here. Now, in the beginning of the New Testament, Jesus had brought back the authority that uh, Adam lost. And he was getting ready now to give that authority over to the church. So there was an explosion 
When you start reading in the New Testament, it's so different than the Old Testament because now the New Testament writers and Jesus, they began teaching openly and boldly about the enemy on practically every page of the New Testament. He's not even hardly mentioned in the Old Testament because they had no power over him. But now under the New Covenant, they've been given the power after the cross. And now the proper time had finally come for the evil one to be clearly uh, revealed. The time of revelation had come that Satan was evil, not God. The time of understanding spiritual warfare had come so that the truth about the enemy came to light. And then all of a sudden he gives us John 10.10 10 as our barometer. Jesus said, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He makes a clear distinction. You can draw a line down the middle of the page and put steal, kill, and destroy, and you can put life and life abundantly on the other side, and you can uh, analyze every single thing that comes on which side it goes on. If it's kill, steal, and destroy, it's coming from the enemy. If it's life and life abundantly, it's coming from God. Get this one message settled once and for all that God is good and in him there is no evil. There is no darkness. And if we could get that ever settled in our mind, it would turn the world upside down. Satan has deceived us with this lie long enough. It's time for a, a generation of Christians to stand up and just teach out of the word, teach out of the life of Jesus. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we'll never find a scripture that makes God look like the bad guy. Remember, there are two rules. Number one, every scripture must be interpreted in the light of the overall word. And number two, any picture of God that does not line up with the life of Jesus is not an accurate picture because Jesus is the exact replica of the Father. He's not similar. He's the exact. Is there a question concerning what God would do? then we should never look at the Old Testament. We should never look at somebody else's life. We need to look at Jesus. Did he ever take a life? Did he ever have put sickness on someone when they came for healing? Did he ever destroy? Absolutely not. I'm going to end with an illustration that God gave me. He said that God's character was like a sculpture artist who chips away at this big block of marble. Well, at first, you can't tell what the sculpture is going to look like. And that's like it was uh, in the Old Testament because they knew so little about God. But as that artist just keeps chipping away, you begin to see a little more and a little more. And it's just a, a gradual uh, revelation of the complete work. And it's only after now he's finished the work and he presents it to the people that you can see and understand what that complete work of art is going to look like. Well, that's exactly what God did. He revealed a little more and a little more of himself. The Jehovah Jireh, the Jehovah Rapha, the Jehovah Nasi, the Jehovah uh, Ra'ab. All through the Old Testament, he was giving a little more and a little more until the complete and final revelation in Jesus. So looking back now to the Old Testament, to find out what God was like would be like looking at a half-finished sculpture to determine what the finished work of art is going to be. Father, I thank you that your word is so clear. It, it, it is so obvious when, when we truly study the word that you're telling us, look to Jesus if you want to know what I'm like. God is telling us that over and over and over. And yet, sadly, so many people run to the Old Testament and they'll come up with an Old Testament scripture to uh, try to describe uh, you, Father, or try to uh, describe your, uh, Jesus. And Father, I ask you to forgive us for this. I'm asking you, Father, that the total truth is going to come out and people are going to realize the only way, Father, that they can know you is by looking at Jesus. He is the exact replica. He's not just a replica of you, Father. He's the exact replica replica. Father, thank you that you are a good God. Thank you there is no evil in you to send. You don't have any evil in you. Father, help us to finally realize that. Help us to realize, Father, that the evil that's in the world is that uh, which is coming from the evil uh, in man, that the evil that we've received from the enemy. Help us to realize you have no evil in you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for revealing more and more and more of your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.